So the part of the scripture that I want to focus on today is there in uh, Genesis, uh, actually, well, in Genesis 19.26, but his wife looked back from behind and she became a pillar of salt. But turn to Luke 17, turn your books to Luke 17, and we're going to get the title of the message from Luke 17. And the title of my message today is, Remember Lot's Wife, A False Religion Works Doctrine. And what I mean by that is, and maybe I, I paused at the wrong place, but a false religion that preaches a works doctrine. And what I'm, what I'm going to preach about today is a little bit different uh, that is normally taught on this message. Not the message itself, because there's nothing new under the sun, but what comes out of this message and how false religions use this to teach a work salvation. So there in um, Luke 17, it says, and it, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus it shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the house top and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. And so Jesus is telling the disciples here to remember Lot's wife, and he's making reference to the days of Noah and to the days of Lot. And the reason that I bring this up, and I touched a little bit about in, in my first sermon today, and, and uh, you know, the Bible says to admonish the brother twice, but I, I had a real interesting conversation with several uh, individuals of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and especially one that's close to me is a family member, and it turns out that as I was uh, preaching the salvation message and that once saved, always saved, uh, I was thrown, uh, not necessarily a curveball, but just even though I've heard most of the arguments, I guess there's always arguments out there you just never heard, and, and the, this individual was like, well, what about Lot's wife? You know, she was saved and then she turned back and lost her salvation. And so it just made me think, and, I, and, and obviously I didn't dwell on that. I, I went to other verses about being a, a child of God in Hebrews 12. And, and I probably should have just uh, admonished them and then moved on. But the point where I was trying to make is I was trying to lead this, this individual to Christ. And they were heart set that there's no way that once saved, always saved is, uh, is possible because Lot's wife was saved and lost her salvation. Now let me make a statement real quick. That's what I was told. We're going to let the Bible do speaking. But one of the things that, that really stands out, you know, and I thought, man, this is so obscure, and I know this individual. I know that they go to the Seventh-day Adventist church. I know they don't study their Bible. So this is something that they picked up, either one of the sermons or one of the conferences or, or, or some Bible study, because it's not something that this individual or the set of individuals that preach this would have picked up on their own. And I'm going to tell you why, if you study your Bible, you would have never picked this up. So before we go into this whole false doctrine and how it actually is prevalent in the false religions and how they use Lot's wife as an excuse for teaching work salvation and how this is an actual real thing, and I just... You know, I've never encountered it, so I never had to had to look it up. But once you look it up, it's been around for a long time. And I, and I have article on top of article and sermon on top of sermon that I'm going to prove to you from the different religions that push this false agenda. And it's just something to be ready for. Now, there's a lot of doctrines out there that are much more prevalent and much more uh, dominant when it comes to false doctrines. But what, the point that I, that I want to make with this message is that we have to be ready for everything that we're thrown. And then we have to use the Bible to explain it. Because if you're a new babe in Christ, initially, that does sound like a work salvation. If you don't know much about the Bible, and you don't know much about how you uh, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you, if, if you're always hearing, repent of your sins. If you're always hearing, repent. Uh, 
and don't sin anymore and be perfect or that you can lose your salvation if you make one key sin. Well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, Lot's wife looks like she's saved. She turns around. She turns into a pillar of salt and now she's not saved. But the reality is so much different from what they've learned. And the, and the thing that's interesting is false religions are like that and false doctrines are like that in the sense that the people that, that latch onto them would much rather believe the individual, the twist of the scripture, than go and verify it in God's word alone. And, and another thing that they do is they shut you up real quick. I said, well, let's go to the, let's go read Genesis 18. Let's read Genesis 19. Let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Second Peter. Let's go look at all the verses that speak on this subject. And and they're like, no, that's a cop out. See. That, that, that's how you show that easy believism is, 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 is the worst thing in the world because all you want to do is jump around just address the issue at hand well the only way to address the issue at hand is let the Bible define its own self you know let God's word define itself so let's look at this story in context now the sermon is not on this story we, we have to set this up in order to be able to tackle the issue so the first thing you see is you know Lot was drawn by the world even though it was wicked. So, first of all, and we're going to get to that point, but I'm going to get ahead of myself here. Lot was saved. Lot is saved. He's in heaven. The Bible tells us that. But that doesn't mean that all of us who are saved are living righteously or walking uh, in God's plan for our life. You know, and Lot was enticed by the world, and he was drawn by the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and by the riches and, and the... Uh, the, the metro lifestyle, you know, being able to live downtown in a loft, or whatever it is that draws you to that. And let's look right there and uh, just go back one page in Genesis 18, verses 20 through uh, 21. Uh, this is Lot, and it says in uh, Genesis uh, 18, 20 through 21, it says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. So one of the things that, that uh, and it's not a lot, I'm sorry, this is just talking about how cry, I mean, God Almighty had pointed out to Abraham that this was a wicked city. And this is where he's making the decision of he's going to let Abraham know what he's going to do. And then obviously he does. And Abraham pleads and says, is there 50? Is there 40? Is there 10? And then there's never the answer. There's never 10. And then God just sends the two angels. But what you're going to see here is it says, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very grievous. In other words, Sodom and Gomorrah were so grievous and wicked in the eyes of the Lord that the only thing left to do was to destroy them. And so a lot of the things that I was reading from these false religions was that Lot, being righteous by his works, lived for God just in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. I disagree. Lot knew that the city was wicked. Lot was in, entrenched. As a matter of fact, I have a feeling that he knew so much so that's why he interrupted those two angels and he was forcing them into his house because he knew exactly what was going to happen because he knew the pattern and the bad habits of that people. So Lot was drawn to that world even though it was wicked. And that's what happens sometimes with us as Christians is we're drawn to the sin and then we don't know how to fight the false testimony. See, Lot couldn't fight because he was in it. And so if he started to preach it, he was gonna lose it. And that's probably one of the mistakes I made is I know better than to try to always preach to family and friends. Because you know, your family and your friends, they know you. They know what you did in the past. And uh, unlike other preachers, they get up and preach. You know, I didn't get saved till I was 25. And before that, we don't have to go into details. I just, I was worldly. I never delved into super unbelievable wicked sin. But I, I, I was worldly, and they did see that side of me. And even though I've now grown in Christ, and even after I got saved, there was a slow process, it, it's not the same thing. Because we as humans, our human nature is to point out the negative in everybody's life instead of seeing the positive. But we know that Lot was drawn by the world even though it was wicked. He pinched, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. In other words, the Bible, and let's just, and what I mean by reading in context is just, let's just look at the facts. Let's look at what this, this, this encounter, this biblical historical story is telling us 
about Lot and his wife and the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if you, if you look there at Genesis 19, verses 15 through 17, uh, you see that it says, And when the morning rose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth, uh, and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And the, th the thing is, you know that he knew, and he was drawn, because even after the angels came, even after they told him what was going to happen, he lingers. In other words, he's like, wait a minute, and, and let me go, you know, you ever going to go on a trip? I remember being little, and you know, my dad wanted to get out for a vacation, and it's like, we're leaving. Well, wait, I forgot my, and, I, and, and we're leaving, and we're leaving, we never left. And finally, my dad would say, you know what, we're just going to leave you behind. And he literally drive the car out and start closing the garage and you're like trying to stumble over the garage and make sure you didn't get left behind. That's what's going on right here. So that's a fact. The facts are Lot was drawn to, the, to a wicked city. He pitched his tent. It just looked so enticing. It looked so uh, alluring. You know, his family, when they were called out, they lingered. They weren't that, uh, they weren't, they, there was no urgency for what, what was going on, for the severity of the situation. And then in Genesis 19:26, which is the famous you know verses that everybody talks about when they're preaching this, is but his wife looked back from behind, and she became a pillar of salt. So all it tells us about Lot's wife is that she looked behind and became a pillar of salt. And I'm going to address that here. Uh, and if you go to 1 John 5:16, we don't know. And, and I and I really studied this at length to just be able to say this with confidence. And look, if I'm wrong, correct me. But nowhere in this passages, this set of passages, if you all the way to the beginning where Lot has the argument with Abraham's uh, workers and there's that separation all the way to this point, you don't see anywhere where it tells us if Lot's wife called on the Lord, if she was righteous. As a matter of fact, they don't really mention her until verse 19. So we don't know if she was saved or unsaved. I'm not going to argue that point. I'm not going to say she was saved or she wasn't saved. But what we do know is that she just looked back, and there was a consequence because there was a command of God. And the Bible tells us that, you know, there are uh, reprobates, you know, and there's consequences for that. They're going to burn in hell forever. But also, the Bible also gives us in 1 John 5, verse 16, gives us an instruction that sometimes us as Christians can sin, and God... Uh, that sin is so grievous, even though we're saved, he's still going to take us out physically. So there's a difference between disobeying God after you're saved and you're just disobedient to God and you remain rebellious. And so we see this in John, in 1 John 5.16. It says, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. And that's a whole other sermon. But So we see that there's sins that are unto death, and there's sins that are not unto death. And specifically here, I mean, it would make sense that if God's going to burn everything and he tells you not to look back, and you look back, that, you know, the punishment fits the crime. Now... That's because that's how God said, God told them specifically. He didn't say what the punishment was. But I mean, this is an instruction directly from God. You know, I mean, I would think in, in today, in 2018, if, if God were to speak to us, which we know that's not the way he communicates with us, it's through the word. But if you, it'd be a lot more serious than if it was like this. And I'm not downplaying actually what the word is. I'm just saying that there's a difference when you get a, a letter of instruction as opposed to when someone looks at you eye to eye. And, and let, me, let me clear that example up so nobody thinks that I'm downplaying the Word of God. The, down, the, the Word of God is serious. And we should take it as such, as if God was talking to us face to face. Our nature is to not always act like that. And what I mean by that is, for example, this day and age with textbook, I mean, uh, texting and Facebook, I was going to say textbook, Facebook and Twitter and all that, 
People have a tendency to be extremely brave behind their computer screens. And they will call you out on things, and they will say wicked things, and they will insult you. But if you ask them to meet you face to face, it's a whole other game. You know, if it's face to face, it, it, it carries a lot more weight. As a matter of fact, when I'm conducting business and I want to uh, talk to someone about the reality of something, if there's something wrong or something positive, I'd rather look them eye to eye or talk to them on the phone than just do it via email because anybody can uh, change the tennis to look positive or negative. And so right here, it's not like they got some telegram. You know, the angels are looking them in the eye saying, look, you need to hurry. We need to get out of here because we're about to burn the city up. And you guys, the only thing that's holding us up is both of you. So it's not like this, this message that came through and it might happen in a day or so. It was happening right there. There's impending doom. So that, that, that's another fact of the whole matter. Now let's look at uh, 2 Peter 2.7. Go to 2 Peter Two, verse seven, and then the final point I want to make about setting this up, because I'm just, I'm just basically setting the foundation for what I'm about to speak is, Lot was saved. Lot is saved. I mean, obviously, once saved, always saved. If you look at Second Peter two, verse seven, the Bible tells us in verse seven and eight, it says, "And delivered just Lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked." In other words, he was just worn down by their conversation. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And so we see there that, that uh, and delivered just Lot for that righteous man dwelling among them. And we know that righteousness only comes through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Believing on that. So the big thing that stands out before I get to the next points is this is how you know that this is a wicked twisting of Scripture. Of all the things that are occurring in this set of, of events, from Genesis 18, when the, the, when the two angels and God go to Abraham, to Genesis 19, when they go into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they see Lot, of all these events, of all this lingering, of all this impending doom, of the wicked daughters he has, of what happens after they leave to the city of Zoar. you got to think that Lot, his, the husband, and the two daughters just lost their mother and their wife, and they're already moving on to other wicked things. And, you know, that's a harder sermon. Of all of this, when you're talking to someone of a false religion, I'm going to name them right now, of this, they're, what they're focused on is, well, Lot's wife tur turned back so she lost her salvation. You're telling me that you read all of this and the one thing that you could gather from this biblical account was that. That's how you know that this is the twisting of Scripture because when you look at it all, just based on the facts, the context of the Scripture, that's the least of the things that are occurring. All that, all that you see there is, look, God said, don't look back. She looked back, turned into a pillar, pillar of salt. That's the facts. That's the biblical encounter that occurred right there. So, what's going on? These false prophets and doctrines, they're, they're mocking easy believism. And you know, I thought it was just a thing. When I first got saved in 2005, I remember calling my brother and my sister, and, uh, and I said, hey, you know, I, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're like, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and now I've learned that it has nothing to do with the Sabbath or with the foods that you eat or how you worship or the commandments. And I was trying, I was new to the faith, so I was trying to explain the moral laws versus the, uh, you know, religious uh, laws and, and the difference between that, how it was in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And one of the things that, that happened was they were making fun of me, and they actually got mad after they made fun of me because... I didn't realize I had stopped going consistently to the Adventist church for right there between the ages of 23 and 25 when I was really searching for the truth is that one of the things that started to dominate was that they're attacking this easy believism. And, and I mean, to this day, I have my brother and other family members will, will make fun 
of the fact that they're like, well, you all you do is preach easy believism. I can't believe it's that easy. It just doesn't make sense. There's no way God would want you to just get saved and then go around murdering. Which, by the way, when we preach the salvation message, I don't, we don't go around saying, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd be going to heaven? No? Okay, great. And let me tell you in the Bible how you can get saved and then go back to doing all the bad things that you were doing. And if you're a murderer, yeah, go ahead. Continue murdering. That's not at all what we're saying. As a matter of fact, we never preach that. We preach a true salvation which says, look, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You know, and then they say, well, what's next? Or for us, what's next? Then we show them how to grow in grace. Because it's the fruit of the Spirit that's going to bring out that willingness to go out there and soul win. Or the willingness to make sure you don't miss church. Or the willingness to start looking at your life and the sin in your life and, and uh, you know, really correcting it. But it's not because you, if you're looking at that first and you think that's going to get you saved, that's wrong. But let's go ahead and just see what the Bible says about all this. So first of all, look. The Bible there in Genesis nineteen fourteen, and then we're going to jump around. You guys don't, uh, you guys don't have to follow me because I'm going to show you a ton of verse today about salvation and how easy it is to overcome. And uh, but the first thing is in Genesis nineteen fourteen, you're going to see there that this is a fact that the mocking has been around forever. Look at Genesis nineteen fourteen. It says, "And Lot went out and spake unto his sons in law, which married his daughters, and said, Up." Get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. And we know that when Noah's time came and, and he was preaching the, the flood, they made fun of him. And so it makes sense that we're preaching about this impending doom, this condemnation of your life, and they make fun of it. And then, and you say, well, how do they make fun of it? Well, sometimes it's directly. Other times it's when you twist scripture. When you take something out of context, it's so obscure. It's so, you know, not explicit. That's a way of mocking or condescending to the Lord Jesus Christ. Especially when he has so many verses in his word about believing unto salvation. Right? But before we go into that, let me just, uh, let me just, uh, go here and and kind of point out a couple of things. I don't want to uh, spend too much time, but uh, right here real quick, I have some facts. And the reason I'm preaching this is because this doctrine that, that is, that I'm, that, that's from the false religions is predominantly in the Seventh-day Adventist community. One of the things that I've noticed is when most of these churches go out soul waiting, unlike ours, and what I mean by ours is, uh, you know, this movement that we, we, we listen to and we follow and people that think like we do where, where we believe soul winning through a thorough presentation of the gospel with the eternal security of the believer and we believe that it should be scheduled and we can, you know, not just, well, at least once a week, but we believe we should do it consistently several times a week or as often as possible is we're going to run into different people. Most of the other groups that soul win that I've run into, I went soul winning uh, down in, uh, in the valley on a Saturday, is that they go soul winning on Saturdays. Their soul winning time, if you look up, is a Saturday. And I'm not against soul winning on Saturday. I soul win Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for, for, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the kingdom. But most of them soul win on Saturday. When you're soul winning on Saturday between the hours of 10 and 12, guess what's one group that you're not going to run into a lot? The Seventh-day Adventists, because they're in church, you know, practicing their false religion. And so one of the biggest deceptions, in, I believe, in my opinion, is that most people focus on the Jehovah's Witnesses, they focus on the Muslims, they focus on the Mormons, and the Seventh-day Adventists are just as bad, if not more wicked, because they're very deceptive. They're not up front about their belief system, and they'll tell you they believe that Jesus is the way. They believe that it's by grace. Uh, but you have to be constantly get saved, or you constantly have to be saved. And here's a couple of statistics just to prove how this is a, a religion that's just kind of flying under the radar, but it's really got some traction. You know, I mean, if you look at the Mormon re religion, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which we know are the Mormons, they, uh, and this is recent, this is as of this year, their membership worldwide is about 16 million. 16 million Mormons worldwide. 
So, and I'll just put this down here. 16 million Mormons worldwide. That's a lot. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't preach against the Mormons. As a matter of fact, the Mormons are a wicked religion, and it's from the pit of hell. Jehovah's Witnesses, they claim that they have about 8 million members. Now, those are the ones that are actively sending in their little uh, cards when they're door knocking. Not so winning, door knocking. So they probably have closer to 10 to 15 million. Their numbers aren't as accurate, but still, it's a big group. But here's what's scary, is that the uh, Adventists have a... Uh, the Adventists have total membership worldwide between 20 million and 25 million as of, and this article is from August 27, 2018. 20 million members worldwide, and every year it, it's gone up and it grow, grows up. And one of the things you're going to hear from an Adventist if you ever ask them, what's the difference between an Adventist, a Seventh day Adventist, and a Baptist? And you're going to say, well, the only difference is we think like you do. We just worship on Saturday, which we know is a lie. Now, here's how, here's how, how you can get to the bottom of this thing. You know, the whole uh, purpose of this sermon of remember Lot's wife and that Lot's wife turned back and she turned into pillar of salt was that for me it was presented as a false doctrine by somebody that I was leading to the Lord. And then when you do the argument, they're fighting with you saying that she was saved because she followed Lot. And then now she lost her salvation and she's in hell. That's the argument I got. And that's, and that's an actual prevalent argument that dates back all the way to 1934. That's about as, as old as I could find it. And it's most recently as of this year. I mean, I found articles. I found uh, uh, sermons. I found scriptures. I found uh, blog posts uh, th from the different religions that are promoting this stuff. Anywhere from the Catholics all the way to the Church of Christ, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witness, the, uh, and the Seventh-day Adventists seem to be the ones that really like this one. There's a lot of Seventh-day Adventist sermons. There's a lot of Seventh-day Adventist blog posts and websites that are promoting this stuff. But what does the Bible say? And I only took 10 sets of scripture, scripture here because I didn't, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to keep you here all night. And I didn't even look up the word believeth. Because that was easy, right? If you, if whoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. I looked up the word believe. Because I just wanted to make a point that there's hundreds of verses talking about how if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. You know, John 1.12 says, But as many as, this, as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 8, 23-24, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I say, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Who is it speaking of? Jesus. John 10, 26. But ye believe not, because ye are not my sheep. And I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So regardless of whether Lot's wife was saved or not, first of all, if she's not saved, she just disobeyed, she turned her pillar of salt, she's in hell immediately. If she is saved, she just sinned unto death, and she's in heaven. Because there's no way to pluck yourself out of Jesus' hand. The Bible is very clear on that. John 20, 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And this is the life that's eternal. We know this. If you read these chapters in full context, obviously I don't have the time to go into all that. Acts 8.36 and as they went out on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you'll do all these works, and then you'll think baptism is... No. He said, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 6, 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. 
knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death had no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he believed, he liveth unto God. One time. That's all it took for him to, to have remission for our to create remission for our sins. If you if you can lose your salvation and you can regain it, what are we doing? Are we killing Jesus all over again on the cross every time we do this? No, the Bible is clear. It says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. Galatians 3.21 Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For there be for if there had been a law given which could have been given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by the faith the, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So that was very specific. It says, look, if if it was going to be by the law, well then we would have we would have known what it was. But no, it's by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. First uh, Timothy 1 15 through 17. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, immortal, invisible, the one, and I don't, I don't remember the rest, of, my wife says I butcher him, so I'm not going to butcher that one, but be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. I mean, how much more, I mean, I could go on and on. Let me just give you a few more and then we're going to be finished with this point. What does the Bible say about salvation? It says plenty about salvation. It has nothing to do with works. It has nothing to do with Lot's wife. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. It says, 1 Peter 1.21, Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfailing love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. There is no way that Lot's wife or anybody who is corruptible could be born again, because it's but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Last one, and then I'll move on to the next point. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, not that you may maybe know, that you might have some idea, no, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I love when we're soul winning, and you knock on someone's door, and you ask them if they know, and they say, well, I don't know, maybe. And then I, we can go to this verse and say, nope. God actually says that you can know and that you believe on the name of the Son of God. But that's just a couple of scriptures. I could have gone on and on. I mean, I encourage you to do a study on the word belief, believe, believeth, faith, and you'll see how God has made salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, and it's just by faith alone. You know, and so... The thing that we have to be careful with is that we have those scoffers and we have those wolves in sheep's clothing and then we have to, then at the end, we have to be sound in our belief and our doctrine. You know, because this is the things that we're ta tackling. I'm going to show you with a couple of uh, sermons and excerpts from these websites how they, these match what I'm about to show you in these verses. Go to 2 Peter 3. Go to Second Peter three, and it's dealing with scoffers. And you know, this is from the Mormons, and this is a guy that's actually real popular. When you look up "Remember Lot's Wife" on Google, several sermons pop up, and the most popular sermon is by a guy, an elder, Jeffrey R. Holland, at the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. He explained how to look to the future with faith instead of doubt. He preached this at the Brigham Young University. The only I could find a few people that preached. Uh, remember Lot's wife correctly 
but I have to actually type the name of the of those pastors. You know, like there's a one by uh, Stephen Anderson, and there's one by Pastor David Burns. And, and but other than that, if you just do a general search for Remember Lot's wife, which end up doing is falling into uh, finding a lot of false doctrine that's taking Lot's uh, wife, uh, which turned and looked back as a work salvation that they lose their salvation. And, and right here, you know, I'm not going to uh, read the whole thing, but here he says, you know, I plead with you not to dwell on days now gone, not to yearn vainly for yesterday, however good those yesterdays may have been. The past is to be learned, but from but not lived in. We look back to claim the embers from glowing experiences, but not to ashes, and we have learned what we need to learn, and we have brought with us the best that we have experienced. Then we look ahead, we remember that faith is always pointed toward the future. Faith always has to do with blessings and truth and events that will yet be efficacious in our lives. So a more theological way to talk about Lot's wife is to say that she did not have faith. She doubted the Lord's ability to give her something better than she already had. Apparently she thought fairly as it turned out that nothing that lay ahead could possibly be as good as those moments that she was leaving behind. That's not even what that's not that hits not given anywhere. They lingered. And, and we know that they chose to be there. We can surmise, but no way does it say that, 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 that that's what she thought. I don't know, man. Curiosity is a hard thing to beat. I mean, fire and brimstone burning down on a city would have been hard even for Lot not to turn around. That just took blind obedience to Christ Almighty, to God, to, the, to that commandment. I mean, let's just be honest. That's a difficult thing. I don't know that we can just necessarily draw all those conclusions. It reminds me of, you know, back in like 2008, they had that, uh, you know, I'd just been saved for a couple of years. My dad came to Houston, and he, uh, he wanted to go to the Museum of Natural History, and they had Lucy. And if you don't know anything about Lucy, uh, that's why, uh, you know, uh, it's the bone, supposedly, of our first ancestor through evolution, which obviously we know that's a lie, but that's, that's what the world teaches. And it's this tiny little skeleton, which first of all, they piece together. And we're sitting there, and obviously, this is ridiculous in my eyes. I, I'm new to the faith, but I know, I've know i never believed in evolution, so I'm kind of annoyed. I'm there for my dad, and obviously, I, I, I wasn't as strong at saying no then than I am now. So anyways, we're there, and the, the, the presenter or whatever is hovering over, and they asked about Lucy or whatever. She said, well, we can surmise from the bones here that Lucy was, uh, you know, that she loved vegetables and that they would grace and that they were, you know, plain dwellers and moving through the things. Look, you can't surmise anything from those bones other than there was a living something there and it died and those are the bones. I don't know much about what those bones were thinking when they were in the flesh of whatever animal they took it from. It's like, I can't tell you anymore other than I somebody wrote a biography about anybody in my past life. Unless I have proof, like I have here biblically, that's all I can draw. I can't sit there and pretend to know what Lot's wife was thinking as she's running away and God's burning Sodom and Gomorrah other than she looked back. And then it gets worse. This is supposed to be a Bible study here from this Mormon guy. It says, President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, that already sounds really weird, related to the following experience of President Joseph Fielding Smith. President Joseph Fielding Smith told me of a repentant woman, there's that repent of your sins, struggling to find her way out of a very immoral life. She asked him what she could do now. In turn, he asked her to read to him from the Old Testament the account of Lot's wife, who was turned a pillar of salt. Then he asked her, what lesson do you gain from the verses? She answered, the Lord will destroy the wicked. Not so, President Smith said, that the lesson for the, this repentant woman and for you is don't look back. Strangely enough, it may be the simplest and most powerful prevention and cure for pornography or any unclean act and in order to avoid this, that works that, you know, delete the, the, from the mind and any unworthy thought that tries to take root. Once you have decided to remain clean, you're asserting your God-given agency and then as President, as President Smith counseled, don't look back. So what he's saying is, and then here at the end he says, true repentance is not only sorrow from sins, and humble penitence and contrition before God, but it involves the necessity of turning away from them sins, a discontinuance of all evil practices and deeds. A discontinuance of all evil practices and deeds? How do you discontinue your sin nature? You can't just turn it off 
You know, you can't just stop producing it. It's manufactured in our uh, fallen nature in our blood. You know, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. That means we're sinning all the time. You can't just turn that off completely. You're not going to be perfect because of that, that would negate the perfect walk of Jesus Christ on this earth. I'm not going to, these are much shorter. I'm not going to read all of them, but this one, I'm not even going to read that. This is just a, a sermon by uh, a pastor. I don't know his name, Ovidiu Radulescu, August 10th, 2009. Uh, he's a Seventh day Adventist, remembering Lot's wife. And it says, Lot's wife is a reminder to us that although we may comply with what God has said, compliance and conversion is not the same thing. All of us here, this Sabbath today, we have obeyed what God said, remember the seventh day and keep it holy. But just because we are here does not mean that we are really keeping the Sabbath. Because keeping the Sabbath is not just rest from the physical work we are doing during the week, but it is a rest from the works of the flesh. It is ceasing from sin that God wants us to experience. So every Saturday, you, you have the ability to stop sinning, according to this guy. And this is the joy of salvation through Jesus. We can be here today in the Sabbath, but the heart can be far away, not in communion with God and enjoying His presence. God is not satisfied with an just and outside obedience. He wants conversion of the heart also. Look, you can't convert your heart. The heart is wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? Jesus does all the saving. So if you look there in 2 Peter, and I'll come back to these, verse 3, three chapter 3, verse 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. See, it's all about the pride of how good they are, how well they keep the Sabbath, or how well they do this, or how many wives they have, or how many whatever doors they knock. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant. Willingly ignorant that the word of God of the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. In other words, I just showed you a ton of verses on salvation is by belief. And you can take it to the bank that these guys have read this. At least the guys that are preaching behind the pulpit. And maybe not. But that means that they're willingly ignorant. Because if you say that you're a preacher of the word, I would have hoped that you've at least read this book once, hopefully twice, and really a lot more than that. You know, I'm not claiming to be, I know guys have read it 30, 40, 50 times, but I've read this book multiple times. At least 10 times, front to back. And, and I know there's guys out there, you know, this is, this is what happens when you get saved later in life. You have to, you're backed up. You know, that's why I admire these guys that went into the ministry young and, and they got married young and they had kids young and they kept themselves unspotted from the world because it just gives them that much boldness and power and authority to preach the Word of God. Because there's a lot in here. And I've read it ten times and sometimes I'll read it and, and, I'll, and I know I've read it a lot and then I'm like, I don't remember reading that part. And, then, and it's not just the 10 times through and through or whatever. I, I mean, I'm using 10. I, I know it's in that range. But then you read certain chapters when you're preparing over and over and over and over again. And you still find something new. And there's a new lesson. But the one thing that's consistent throughout the entire Bible is that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And it's through faith in Him that we're saved forever. You know, go to uh, Matthew 7.15. Actually, don't go. Go to 2 Timothy 4.1. I'll just read Matthew 17. 7.15 for you says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You know, these false religions that I'm talking about, I mean, sometimes they dress better than us, they speak better than us, they live better than us, but they're ravening wolves. We've got to stop pretending like that Seventh-day Adventist preacher that treats you nice is nice. No, he's not. Because he's willingly ignorant and leading people to hell. And there's a destruction for him and for those that he's led to hell. I'm not going to read this one, but basically, I mean, this this is, remember Lot's wife is talking about work salvation, and this article goes back to the Australian record, Sydney, Monday, January 29th, 1934. Here's another one. I couldn't tell what religion this was. It's just, I know it's a religion. And uh, it's just the bottom uh, says, uh, Lot's wife shrank back and turned into a pillar of salt. 
She thus became a memorable illustration of Christians who lose their salvation in Christ. Are you kidding me? You draw, you drew all of that from that story. Not the fact that there were reprobates in the city. Not the fact that God destroyed for that wicked sin of sodomy. Nope. All she did is turn back and she lost her salvation. Here's the Church of Christ. Same thing. I'm not even going to read it, but at the end of the article, it's basically saying that it's work salvation. That you can lose your salvation. You know, here's a, this guy that has a... It's called... A, well, his name's Doug Batchelor. And this guy is famous in Adventist circles. He has the uh, watchtower. The, no, not the watchtower. The... Uh, oh, man, I forgot the thing. Because I... He, the Amazing Facts. If you go online, he has this thing called Amazing Facts. And it's this website where he's just, I guess, promoting Amazing Facts of the Bible. And he's actually a pastor of Granite Bay Church in California. You notice the, bio, the church doesn't say Seventh-day Adventist Granite Bay Church. If you go to the website, Amazing Facts, you can't find anything about him that says that he's a Seventh-day Adventist, from his biography down to anything. That's how deceptive and wicked and evil this guy is. He knows that if he ties the Seventh-day Adventist, he won't get as much traction. And in there, he has a blog post, and he's talking about, you know, the story of Lot's wife is a dramatic illustration that the presence of one small act of willful disobedience can lead to eternal loss. Look, there's only one small act, and it's not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not willful disobedience because you're condemned already. The Bible says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Now, I know I've said that several times, but apparently it needs to be said several times because even this day and age, with all the verses that are in the Bible, with easy English to read, that seems to be a concept that just goes over people's head. I mean, how is it that there's one small, what's one small act of... So when I lie, when, when I think of that thought, which one is it? Because the Bible tells us in Revelation 21.8, gives us a list, and in there it includes liars, which a lot of people think a white lie is not a bad thing, you know? So I don't, I don't get it. But, uh, you know, I'll close out with uh, 2 Timothy 4.1, and we're going to be in, uh, in 2 Timothy again, and then in Titus. I'm just letting you know. And here's one in Spanish. I couldn't find the English one, but Jehovah's Witnesses. And basically, right here at the end, I'm going to translate it, but it says, from this story, we can learn a, le a lesson that God saves those who are obedient that those who are not obedient to him lose their lives. That's not what God says in the Bible. I just read you all those verses. I mean, there's verse after verse after verse of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the last three set of verses and we'll close this out. It says 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. See, there's nothing more sound than understanding salvation. See, but that but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having e itching ears. And I always think of a heap, a heap of something. You just have this big stack of idiot teachers telling them what they want to hear. Right? It says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. See, that's a fable. That she turned back and lost her salvation. There's nothing in the Bible to indicate that. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. Titus 1.5, while I read that, go to 2 Timothy 2.14, or if you want to follow me there in Titus 1.5, it says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. And ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee. In any, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers 
especially day of the circumcision. Which, by the way, there's a lot of false religions that promote circumcision. So God was not out of his time when he was saying this. It says, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses teaching things which they ought not to for filthy lookers' sake, whose mouths must be stopped. In other words, speak out so strongly against them that they're embarrassed to get behind the pulpit. See, it bothers me that I have close family members that are listening to this crap and are going to hell because they're not being taught that they should verify everything in the Word of God. See, if I said something today that's wrong, you know, I don't know if everything that I taught you today is right. Go to the Bible, and if the God speaks to you and you see something correct in the Bible that I got wrong, guess what? Follow what the Bible says. It's simple as that. God's Word is above all words. You know, let's look at 2 Timothy 2, 1, 4. 2, 1, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 14. It says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. In other words, when our sound doctrine, when we speak boldly from the word of God, it's for a profit. Because if we're just speaking out, it's for no profit. But to the subverting of the hearers, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. This is the verse that Pastor Cobb used when he ordained me. But shun, in other words, kick out or don't allow profane and vain babbling. See, don't even engage in this kind of talk. The reason that I'm preaching on it is because we must stop them. We must call them out. But when you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, hey, move on. Get to somebody who wants to hear the word. That's a dangerous rabbit trail. Look, if somebody believes something so obscure in the Bible that it's not even clear whether that's what happened, you know, you've got another thing coming because I can show you verse after verse like I did today where the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe, 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 believe. Believe on what? The Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe, believe, believe. And yet somehow, people want to say, believe but. Believe but. Believe but. And that's not what the Bible says. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, let your doctrine be sound. Let your, your light shine amongst men and be ready for those fights. And fight these things that are obscure. You think, man, you did a whole sermon on just something so obscure. It's not that obscure in the false doctrines, guys. And, and there's people out there that believe this crap and are going to hell. And it hurts my soul and it hurts my heart to know that I have family members that are going to burn in hell. But here's the worst part. If they believe it, and this church has 25 million members. There's 25 million people that believe this, that need to hear the truth. That's 25 million people that are headed to hell. You know, I know that the Lord's not going to return any time, at least not in the foreseeable future. But if He were to return today, that's millions of people that are going to hell. And what did we do to stop that wave? What did we do to tell the people that that's not the way to salvation? So I guess, you know, I know I preached a lot about soul winning, uh, you know, this morning and even today, but that's really where your heart should be. You know, these, these individuals, this is a serious thing of life and death, and it's life eternal and death eternal. If either we're, we're out there fighting the good fight, or what are we doing? Just taking advantage and hoarding this salvation all to ourselves? I don't think that's the way God wants us to act. So anyways... Thank you for your time. Let's go ahead and uh, close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today, and uh, thank you for the time and the ability to preach this message. It's a little bit difficult to put put it all in words, and I hope that I did it justice. But it is a, a sounding alarm, at least it was for me, to be able to to have uh, run into this issue and and to see how how easily people get thrown off the, the path and how lies and scams are easier to sell than, than the truth. And so, Lord, just help us to do the truth, to preach the truth, to be instant in season and out of season for your glory and your honor and for leading others to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just realize something, brother. Mm.
camera has a time limit on the lower end videos. Oh! 